The project on nuclear issues I wanted to mention is principally a program that is designed to identify and cultivate and nurture individuals who want to come into the field of, of nuclear policy um, writ large, nuclear nonproliferation, nuclear deterrence, nuclear security, but that overall uh, security challenges that are looking at uh, nuclear matters. We focus on bringing together people from the technical community, the operational community, the policy community, in and out of government, and uh, really focus on those next generation folks that we need to kind of take the jobs of people like me uh, a bit down the road. Um, we have people involved in our programs. Some are undergrads. They tend to be pretty exceptional, but I think we have at least one uh, undergrad who's been speaking at a Pony conference before or just graduated. Is that right, Henrietta? Yeah. Um, so we start about there and we go right up through folks who are in early career uh, stages in their first or second job. They're actually working in the, in the field and we try to create programming and opportunity. As part of that, one of the things we try to do within Pony is to create an environment where we can have what we call a really big tent to look at issues from all perspectives and from all sides. Um, in some cases, we take on some pretty controversial issues, and this debate series that we've been doing is one of those. We've really tried to go to the heart of some of the more challenging and, um, and frankly, hotly debated topics inside the nuclear policy domain and uh, convene people to look at that from uh, as many angles on the issue as we can do. We've been uh, grateful to partner with Plowshares in this debate series, and they uh, very much agreed and supported the idea of doing at least one of the five debates here on the West Coast. And so you are, if you are here for a debate on the future of uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear program and which, what should the United States do, then you are indeed in the right place. Um, a few things about tonight's discussion. We, um, this debate is co-sponsored co with Plowshares and uh, we will be, um, the team will be sort of live tweeting. Uh, if you use a hashtag um, CSIS Live, that'll be great. That'll help uh, get everyone into the same place. The meeting is on the record. It is being recorded, uh, will not be live streamed because we don't have our same CSIS capabilities, but it will be uploaded onto the CSIS website and be available uh, through a link there um, after a couple of days, right Will? So we will have this record of the debate series, including uh, the prior debates. Our fourth debate will actually be back in Washington, but for those of you who are West Coast based, you'll have the opportunity to see it live stream live or uh, to see the recording of it. Uh, we'll be back at our CSIS headquarters and we will be debating the future of the US nuclear stockpile and whether the current approaches of life extension programs, stockpile stewardship, the three plus two warhead plan, and the continued testing moratorium are sufficient to meet the future deterrence needs of the United States, or whether some types of new nuclear weapons are necessary to be brought into the U.S. arsenal. We have quite a lineup for that debate next week as well. Um, we will have the Honorable Ellen Tauscher and Adam Mount um, at the Center of American Progress, uh, who will be on one side of the discussion, and on the other will be former DOE and DOD official John Harvey and Dr. Corey Shockey from out here at Stanford, who will take the other side of the discussion. So that will be quite lively. Um, so I encourage you to tune in for that and also to check out our website, our programming, especially if you're a young scholar interested in nuclear issues and interesting in, interested in finding ways to participate in our programs. With that, background, what I'm going to do now is turn to the issue at hand. Um, there are probably few topics on the national security agenda that are more pressing than North Korea's growing nuclear and missile capabilities and the threat they pose to the United States and our allies. I think the tragic death of Otto, Otto Warmbier and the, the series of events that have surrounded about that have, have heightened the emotional uh, concern and issues and uh, visibility of this issue. Um, but it has only grown more stark um, over the recent weeks, months, and even last few years. Um, for decades, really, the United States and his allies have struggled to find long-term solutions to prevent North Korea from advancing its nuclear program, but it has continued to do so nonetheless. 
The Trump administration promised an end to the most recent approach. Uh, it was called by some strategic patience. In March, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson stated, we are exploring a new range of security and diplomatic measures. All options are on the table. As the administration seeks the best path forward, the question here for us today is should they look solely to diplomatic negotiations or as a stronger defense and military posture, potentially including preemptive strikes, essential to keeping North Korea from threatening the continental US with its advancing ballistic missile program and related nuclear weapons program. So we have a terrific lineup today. Um, before I get into introducing them and explaining their backgrounds, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this works. There will be an opportunity for you all to engage. The debate question, the resolution uh, on the table today is as follows. Diplomatic negotiations are the only way to prevent North Korea from fielding long-range ballistic missiles. Each, uh, each debater will have five minutes for their opening statement for a total of 10 minutes per team. Following the opening statements, the moderator, that's me, will ask a question of each of the presenters and allow two minutes for response. At the conclusion of the moderator questions, Team Carol and Hannum will have five minutes total for a rebuttal, followed by the uh, Team Magsman and Warden, who will have five minutes from their perspective. We'll then open the question for Q&A, and I'll ask that you try to organize a bit in terms of your, steering your questions towards both sides, and obviously we'll try to keep it somewhat even. So, you know, look at, look at that, and I, I'll start to pick or ask um, so that we can go back and forth. So we'll have a few minutes for that, but we will make sure we leave time at the end for a five-minute closing statement on each side. Now, in case you're wondering, there'll be little signs in the front, and it's going to keep these guys on a very tight timeline, which they have very much practiced for. There'll be a green sign that says, begin talking, a yellow sign you says, you've only got a minute left, and a red sign you really don't want to see it. It's stop now, no matter what. Um, so it's a great, um, they'll be seeing that, so you'll be a little sign, and you know, um, but hopefully that won't be too obvious to you. Okay. So let me tell you just a little bit about our uh, participants today. Um, argue in, arguing in favor of the need for a diplomacy-only approach, we have two terrific speakers. Paul Carroll currently serves as the Director of Programs at the Plowshares Fund. He directs all of the Plowshares grant-making efforts and provides strategic guidance to the President, the Executive Director, and the Board. Prior to joining Plowshares in 2000, he worked on nuclear weapons issues in the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment and the U.S. Department of Energy. He has a wide range of expertise in nuclear weapons matters, ranging from the Department of Energy's nuclear weapons infrastructure to the North Korea's nuclear weapons program and the challenges involved in limiting it. And he has traveled twice to the DPRK with non-governmental delegations. Joining him in this position is Melissa Hannum. She is a senior research associate in the East Asia Nonproliferation Program at the James Martin Center, where she investigates new techniques in open source geospatial analysis, incorporating imagery and other remote sensing data, large data sets, social media, 3D modeling, and GIS mapping. I don't even know what some of those things are, but they sound very important. She also assists in export control in the export control and nonproliferation project with research on proliferation financing and money laundering. And previously, she worked for the International Crisis Group in Beijing, China, and Seoul, South Korea. So, arguing against the proposition in favor of a more muscular approach to North Korea, we have also two outstanding speakers. First, we have Kelly Magsman, who is an adjunct lecturer at the Johns Hopkins University at the School of Advanced International Studies, SICE in DC. She previously served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian Pacific Affairs. She's held a number of senior White House positions. Most recently, she served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for, senior, for Strategic Planning on the National Security Staff. Joining Kelly is John Warden, actually one of Pony's own, for those of you who have been with the program a bit. He is a, we like to, you know, credit and claim wherever we can. Always. He is a senior policy analyst at SAIC, where he focuses on U.S. defense policy and strategy, deterrence and nuclear weapons, U.S. alliances, and other related issues. In March, John published a very highly regarded article entitled, North Korea's Nuclear Posture, an Evolving Challenge for U.S. Deterrence. 
Previously, he was a senior fellow for U.S. National Security Policy at the Pacific Forum and a research assistant and program coordinator for the Defense and National Security Group and the Project on Nuclear Issues at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So we are very happy to welcome him back as well, even if it's here on the West Coast. So with that, I'm going to join the team at the table, and uh, we will get started. Well, we had the um, coin toss outside, <laughs> and uh, we've determined that uh, those arguing in favor of the proposition will go first, and that Paul Carroll will offer the first opening statement. So over to you, Paul. All right. Is this thing on? Yes, it is. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Kelly and John, and my teammate, Melissa, and those in the audience for being here. I have five minutes, which I think may be longer than any of the missile tests to date for North Korea, not to diminish the significance of them. Um, North Korea is often referred to as the land of lousy options, and there's very good reason for that. If this were easy, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be in the situation, the geopolitical, the strategic situation the world is in. It's been decades in the making, and there's been a lot of attempts, as, as Rebecca mentioned to sort of solve the North Korean puzzle. But when it comes to the toolbox, there really aren't that many tools in it. Uh, the conventional wisdom, the, the continuum is, is pretty short. They basically boil down to sporadically, but I would argue effective diplomatic choices, sticks and carrots as they're often referred to, military brinksmanship or proportionate response from the old deterrence language that has been ineffective, but more importantly, highly risky. And then basically all in, a military attack, a preemptive or preventive attack that seeks to eliminate North Korea's missiles and nuclear program all in one fell swoop. So when considering this list, the least bad choice and one that has in fact shown some success is diplomacy. So I'd like to take this list in reverse order and take a, a quick look at why we believe that that is. Direct military attack, even the most hawkish observers and experts agree that to attempt a large scale military strike on North Korea would result in monumental loss of life and likely a regional war. Regional war, that includes South Korea, China, likely Japan. This isn't limited. Oh, and by the way, they also agree that we probably would not get every missile or nuclear weapon. So finding that successful is, is hard to do. We also cannot ensure that this would destroy or decapitate the regime. If the regime survives and there's any semblance of, of its society left, it would likely double down on its resolve to create weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them. In May, Secretary of Defense Mattis, before Congress, said it will be a war more serious in terms of human suffering than anything we've seen since 1953. It will involve massive shelling of the Allies' capital, which is one of the most densely packed cities on Earth. He's speaking about Seoul. It would be a serious, it would be catastrophic war, especially for innocent people in some of our allied countries, to include Japan most likely. So that's direct to military attack, or prevention, if you will. Military posturing, or as, as some increasingly have advocated, let's take the gloves off. When they do something provocative, let's respond in kind and proportionate. This is more of a tactic and a reactionary response than a strategy of containment or resolution. It occurs each spring when we have joint exercises with, with South Korea and on occasion in response to D DPRK provocations, bomber flyovers and so on. It has never done anything to constrain North Korea and arguably it exacerbates things and again it increases the risk of accidental war. Now diplomacy, admittedly it's very frustrating but it is not simply carrots. Sanctions are part of the diplomatic toolbox. Sanctions I would argue are not designed to stop their programs. They're designed to increase the cost and the pain and therefore bring them back to the table. But it has proven at times to work. The agreed framework for all of its warts and all of its pitfalls over the course of eight or nine years actually limited and constrained North Korea's fissile material production and missile and rocket program. In fact, there was a moratorium from 1999 to 2006 and Yongbyon, its plutonium production reactor, was frozen in 2005. 
In the long term, yes, these unraveled, but it requires patience and consistent high-level effort. Victor Cha, who some of you may know for a CSIS person, as, as, as a matter of fact, says no U.S. policy should be composed only of sanctions, military exercises, and diplomatic isolation. Historians would remember such a policy as paving a path to war. I think Victor is exactly right. Diplomatic negotiations, which are currently absent, are the missing ingredient and the only thing that will prevent North Korea from fielding long-range missiles. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa. Thank you uh, for having me here today, and I really appreciate all of you coming out to Berkeley to hear us, um, especially some of my former students. I'm really touched. Uh, but my biggest thanks are to CSIS and Plowshares for pulling together this really much needed discussion. Um, I have uh, some remarks that will dovetail on what Paul has already laid out. Um, Paul has made the case that uh, war is the least of several bad options. But I also want to emphasize that we have a very short time horizon to work with. The DPRK capabilities are advancing more quickly than we had anticipated. Even in the open source, um, my colleagues and I can see that their missile technology is improving rapidly. They're di diversifying their missile delivery systems. And after five nuclear tests, it's very likely that they do indeed have a miniaturized warhead. Diversifying their forces and, and allowing uh, a warhead is sort of like trying to close the door after the horse has left the barn. I think uh, as we look towards our remaining options, we have to think about what we are already living with. Um, these weapons are difficult to track. Uh, we, you know, we being the US, South Korea, and Japan make every effort to use satellite imagery and other types of technology to track these mobile forces, but they are difficult to track. And um, what we're also seeing is an evolution in not just the technology that they are displaying, but the unit uh, deployment. These are no longer becoming just exercises to demonstrate a new weapon. These are exercises to strike Tokyo, <laughs> or, or as we've seen um, most recently, Iwakawa, Air Force Base in Japan, um, and, and that this is uh, not a plan that will work um, uh, unless they go first. North Korea is not so dumb that they would not realize that there would be an overwhelming response to any type of military hostility to a US ally like South Korea or Japan. However, they also know that if there is to be any success had in any size conflict, limited or full scale, they need to go first. They need to nuke the Air Force Base where the F-15 bombers are coming for, from, and they need to shell Seoul to the ground. If there was a time for military in intervention, that has happened long ago. The window has closed, and unless you're willing to accept enormous losses. As General Mattis has already said, this is not an option we want to go and pursue. Instead, please let me try to discuss what options remain in the diplomatic sphere. Again, this is an option that isn't one that we're going to be very enthusiastic about, and I think it's going to be rather painful. We're going to have to accept some things that the US, South Korea, and others have not been able to accept yet. And that is that by de facto, North Korea is a nuclear state. That by de facto, they are capable of holding at risk cities uh, of our allies. And so when they, we come to this negotiation, we're going to have to start considering things like dropping preconditions to discussions. That's the easiest one to start considering. There should be no precondition to uh, discussions. Uh, in addition, we are going to have to start thinking about those things which North Korea desires the most and those things which we desire the most. We're no longer looking to eliminate or remove nuclear weapons from the Korean Peninsula at this time. I think we're going to have to accept capping 
their nuclear and missile capabilities. We're going to have to take that painful long look and decide that there are, um, uh, much like Sig Hecker's three no's, um, no new ma fissile material, no new devices, no new tests to improve the quality of existing devices. In addition, we want to look at missiles, no new missile tests, no new missiles, no proliferation of missiles. These types of activities are probably the best that can be gotten at this point. The last point I want to say is we have to think about what North Korea desperately wants, and that is possibly going to be for a rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll hold that one. And, and But with that, I'm now going to turn to Kelly to take on your side here. Great. This one. Is this one? Great. Um, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, I will echo what others have already said. North Korea is a pretty tricky problem. Uh, the graveyard of North Korea policy is littered with lots of bodies, including mine, so it's a pleasure <laughs> to be here and, and try over again. Um, as I see it, there are two fundamental problems we have with North Korea. The first being that we don't have a willing dance partner in negotiations um, in a meaningful way. And not only do we not have a willing dance partner, we don't have a trusted or tested one in Kim Jong-un. So there's no sign that he's actually interested in negotiating away any of his capabilities. In fact, he's quite honestly demonstrated the opposite. He is a man on a mission. I think the last few years have demonstrated that. Uh, he is deeply aware of what happened in Libya uh, to Muammar Gaddafi. That is very present in his mind in terms of how he thinks about having a credible deterrent to a US uh, attack or, or Korean attack. And so while I support diplomatic efforts under uh, the right conditions, I also think we need to acknowledge that there's definitely not a guarantee of success. We've had a lot of failure in the past. And I don't think there's also the guarantee of success in reaching a meaningful deal or one that Kim Jong-un won't cheat on. Um, and worse, I think if negotiations do break down or if Kim Jong-un does cheat, the risks are actually higher today than they were in 2005 um, for, for lots of reasons, in part because of the capabilities they've already achieved. So there are also real risk of a limited deal, which John will speak to in terms of just focusing on, on a uh, ICBM capability. So if we are to pursue diplomacy, we really need to raise our game in terms of the level of coercive diplomacy that we would pursue. And, and to do that, we're gonna have to employ a lot of other tools, including the military tool set along a spectrum. So this brings me to our second problem, which Melissa already talked about, but there is a flip side argument to the time problem. And the time problem is that they already have a level of capability um, that if we were able to achieve some sort of moratorium on ICBM testing, for example, I actually think um, we could put ourselves in a much more dangerous position if they decide to actually renege on the deal later and then just rush to the finish. I think we may end up giving up too much on the front end to get that moratorium. So where does that leave us? Um, you know, diplomacy alone is not going to solve this problem. I think we just sort of discussed that. Um, first, we have to up our defense game. Um, we need to accelerate the strengthening of our layered regional and uh, homeland defenses, regardless of diplomatic efforts, but especially in tandem with them in the event of failure. And at a minimum, accelerating these eff efforts will provide essential reassurance to our allies and put us in a stronger position. So what do I mean by that? I mean increasing ISR in the region to improve early warning. We need to strengthen our Korean allies' uh, conventional deterrence and demonstrate our own ability to fight a limited war, which we can get into a little later. Um, so that includes putting potentially more US conventional capability on the peninsula, increasing the scope and pace of our exercises, and improving Korean counterfires capabilities so they are, they're able to actually uh, push back on the, the missile salvos that the North Koreans might use. Uh, we need to strengthen our trilateral defense cooperation, which has been um, getting better lately with Korea and Japan. Um, that needs to be accelerated. We need to strengthen our Japanese defenses, potentially, including looking at um, putting additional Aegis coverage on Japan, supporting a Japanese decision uh, to acquire Aegis ashore or THAAD, and potentially, if the Japanese decide to go there, uh, pursuing offensive strike capability for Japan. And despite its controversies, I also think we need to uh, accelerate work on homeland uh, GMD defense. Um, I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One is we need to have the capability. And two, um, 
we need to be able to complicate North Korean decision making in terms of whether or not Kim Jong Un would ever even think about launching an ICBM. So all that needs to be done. So second, we need to kind of get outside our normal playbook, um, even on the de defensive side. So looking at extended deterrence, I think it's time to take a really close look at how we can demonstrate both our will and our capacity on extended deterrence. And that could be creative options like dual, dual capable aircraft on the peninsula or other demonstrations of US capabilities in that regard. And then finally, we definitely need more economic pressure. I, I agree with Paul on that. I do think it's part of the toolkit. It needs to be in tandem, I think, with some of this, the military pressure. And we can't outsource this problem to, to China. Um, they're certainly part of the solution, but they clearly have de de deviating interests from ours. Um, now is a time for us to hold their interests at risk. And finally, my last point is all options need to be on the table. That doesn't mean that um, you know, anyone's looking for preemptive strike, certainly. I think everyone understands the potential consequences of that. But we want to give the president as many options as possible. And I actually think it would be unwise to pull that card this early in the negotiation. John? Uh, thank you. Um, I'll echo the thanks for everyone to CSIS, Plowshares, and Berkeley for hosting us and to, for the invitation and to the other panels for participating. Um, so let me start with a basic question. Why do we care about North Korea having nuclear weapons in the first place? Um, there are a lot of reasons why we care, but I think the core reason, and Paul talked about this a little bit, is that we want to avoid war. And there's some risk, and I think a high risk, that if we allow North Korea to pursue these capabilities or pursue the type of negotiation that the affirmative wants, that we might actually end up making war more likely. So the Kim regime has a long history of using military threats to consolidate power domestically, to try to change public opinion in South Korea, to try to divide the US-South Korea alliance, or to try to extract concessions. They have initiated a whole bunch of limited provocations of military conflicts in the past. And they also, if you'll remember, tried to reunify the peninsula by force when they started the first Korean War. And there's some chance they might do so again. So as it's North Korea, as their nuclear capabilities advance, the risk is that North Korea might become more confident and think that it having stronger military, in particular nuclear capabilities, that it can initiate these type of provocations or conflicts and use its nuclear capabilities to control escalation. That's the real risk about North Korea building up and having nuclear capabilities. So our key interest is deterring North Korea from carrying out those type of provocations or limited wars. And if that fails, God forbid, if there's a miscalculation or if there's an intentional reason for a war, our interest is in deterring North Korea from using a nuclear weapon against one of our allies or the United States. That is the key lens through which we should judge these options when we're looking at them. So Kelly persuasively laid out the case for why one, Negotiations have very little chance of succeeding for the reasons that she said. And two, the United States should instead focus on expanding our offensive and defensive capability to strengthen deterrence so that North Korea can't execute the type of coercive strategy that they might if they have nuclear weapons. Let me add two reasons, though, why U.S. pursuit of negotiations, and particularly negotiations focused on capping North Korea's missile and nuclear program, might actually be counterproductive. First, centering diplomacy on capping missile capabilities would send a disastrous signal, in my opinion, to North Korea and our allies, while doing little to improve our ability to actually deter North Korea. Why is that? A cap, or a deal that focuses on preventing North Korea from getting an ICBM, would still allow for North Korea to continue to develop and deploy short, medium, and intermediate range missiles. As uh, Melissa said, they, they have actually already have all those capabilities and have demonstrated them in, there have been public demonstrations that they've actually been using some of these capabilities in exercises. If they have those type of capabilities, that means that they can already use nuclear weapons to target U.S. military bases in the region that are in South Korea and Japan, and also population centers such as Tokyo and other parts of South Korea. So they already have the ability to carry out these nuclear coercive threats. In short, North Korea, even if a cap was instituted, would still be confident that it could control escalation, and therefore it might be more aggressive and more likely to start a war in the first place. But more important, pursuing a cap or an ICBM deal would signal to our allies and to North Korea that the United States only cares about ourselves. We would say it's OK if there are these nuclear capabilities or missiles that are pointed at our allies in the region, but it's not OK if it's pointed at the United States. To North Korea, that signals that if they can hold the US at risk, 
then the U.S. won't actually come to the defense of its allies. That's a weak signal of extended deterrence. To our allies, this signals that, in fact, their fears that the United States isn't a reliable partner are true, that the U.S. isn't really willing to endure high costs to come to the defense of their allies. And therefore, South Korea and Japan might start making their own decisions about what they're going to do to provide for their own defense, maybe even pursuing their own nuclear weapons if they think that that's what's needed. So second, the concessions that would likely be part of any deal would strengthen North Korea's ability to pursue aggression. As they laid out in their speech, in order to get North Korea to accept these kind of deal, we're going to have to make a lot of concessions. North Korea is very attached to their ICBM program and uh, all of the aspects of their missile program and their nuclear capabilities. Some of the things that they've demanded are things like normalization of relations or limits on U.S. and ROK military exercises. If we accept those type of limits and, for example, relieve a whole bunch of sanctions and open up investment, then North Korea will have more money and more economic development that it can fund into its, its nuclear program, but also its other military capabilities, which is made a clear priority. And if we limit our military exercises, then the readiness of U.S. and ROK forces and Japanese, on the other hand, will also be decreased. This is exactly what might invite North Korea to think that they have an advantage and they can actually carry out a coercive strategy and potentially start a war on the peninsula. Thank you. Great. Well, that puts a lot of information on, on the table. What I'd like to do now is ask a few questions of both sides. I'll go back and forth to try to kind of push some of these issues just a little bit further. Um, Paul, let me turn to you first, if I may. Um, it seems that, uh, indeed, a large-scale military removal of the North Korean nuclear capability does seem like a stretch. Um, that would be certainly a big war. But don't you think the United States should be prepared to use force in somewhat more limited fashion to preempt or degrade a nuclear armed missile from having the opportunity to strike the U.S. or its allies? Is it really such an all or nothing proposition? Don't the American people expect us to have and try to use some of those capabilities to protect them? I think when you get into the ideas and the theories of limited military strikes or responses. It's a very neat concept, but in practice, it's not. It's, it's sort of like, okay, I've got six cups of, uh, you know, six cups on the floor, a couple have gasoline in them, a couple have water, I'm gonna throw a match, see what happens. Um, I, I don't wanna be too flip about this, but in your question, I, I, I thought of sort of two different scenarios. Preemption is, it's very important to understand, is very different than prevention. Preemption is, they're fueling a missile. We think maybe it has a nuclear warhead on it, or even if it doesn't, they're going to launch it at Seoul, at Tokyo, and the threat is imminent. This is what preemptive strikes mean. In a case like that, I would argue, if the intelligence was as good as we could get, and if we felt as confident as we could be that we could take it out, then yes, that's an option to strongly consider. I would also say at that point, we would have clearly have failed in restraining North Korea long-range missile program, or, or as the question asks, fielding it. However, that is different than looking at military strikes, or let's take the example from 2010 when North Korea sank a South Korean naval vessel and 46 sailors lost, lost, lost their lives. What might be a response to that militarily? I, I can find none that would be considered proportionate by the North Koreans, or something that they would say, oh yeah, we poked you, you get to poke us back. It, I don't wanna take that kind of a risk. So when we get into that, that kind of a snowball effect or that kind of a domino effect, I think it's extremely risky when you're talking about really a long-term endeavor of limiting and ultimately preventing fielding missiles. Okay, thank you. John. Um, clearly any policy we'd have would be interested in trying to prevent a serious cleavage between the United States and our allies. Um, at least that would, that would appear to be the, the position of, of, of all sides. I guess my question for you is, isn't it possible that a strategy designed to cap um, North Korean uh, missile, nuclear armed uh, missile capabilities, ICBM capabilities, in fact potentially be actually a strategy designed to prevent such a cleavage? It seems perhaps that if North Korea was able to hold the United States at risk in a more serious way, wouldn't that raise anxieties 
from either Japan or South Korea that perhaps we could be cleaved from them in the event of a crisis? Um, yes. I, my short answer is I think it's, it's certainly possible, and there are probably some, some who have that view. Uh, my, my opinion is that the bigger risk is sending the opposite signal, that if we send the signal to them that we're only concerned about protecting the U.S. homeland and not as concerned about protecting their territory, and that we're so concerned about protecting the U.S. homeland and such that we're basically demonstrating to North Korea and our allies that if a country could threaten the U.S. homeland with some limited amount of nuclear weapons, that that would be enough to deter us from coming to their defense. Um, so that's a difficult position to be in. And then the other thing that, that makes me um, somewhat skeptical of that argument is that when you think about what the coercive threat that North Korea is going to be going to be issuing, they're going to be threatening to use nuclear weapons to try to get some country to back down. In my mind, I actually most worry about Japan backing down rather than the United States. So if you think about if we're, there's a war on the Korean Peninsula and the U.S. is coming to the defense of Korea, it requires flowing forces through Japan. There are U.N. rear bases in Japan in which forces have to go through in order to get to Korea. So we can't you know, fight as effectively on the Korean Peninsula if Japan decides to back out. So North Korea might say something, even without an ICBM, where it just has these medium and, and nuclear capabilities, where it says, Japan, if you don't back down, we're going to launch a nuclear weapon at you. And if that capability exists, and the United States has sent this signal to our allies that we're not a reliable partner and not willing to take on a lot of costs to come to their defense, which is what the essence of extended deterrence is, then I think that that might actually put us in a, in a worse position. Okay. Melissa, if we, you know, went forward with your proposition in terms of a, a negotiation based on capping the, the program, I guess my question for you is, that would mean accepting a nuclear-armed North Korea, and if we ch were to decide to accept and build into our longer-term sort of defense and national security planning and strategy a nuclear-armed North Korea, uh, sorry, North Korea, wouldn't we really have to look at how to bolster our deterrence posture? And isn't that sort of increasing deterrence posture actually a fundamental element of the same strategy if you're not going to go after um, complete denuclearization? So don't you actually, you know, how do you reconcile that um, in terms of protecting uh, U.S. allies and our own and our own interests in a permanent nuclear armed North Korean state. Sure. So I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on what I was suggesting by capping. Um, I think this is again not a decision we want to come to. This is a decision that we are de facto in the situation of. So we can continue to say that North Korea is not a nuclear state, but. They've had five nuclear tests. Uh, they hold uh, enough missile material for several nuclear weapons. And they are, in many ways, a nuclear state. Um, I think in the past, we've treated uh, you know, uh, India, Pakistan, Israel, others outside of the NPT as sort of special circumstances. Um, I don't think we should perhaps allow North Korea back into the NPT as a nuclear state. I think that was at a horrible precedent. However, I do think that between what North Korea wants, which is recognition, maybe in word only, um, that, that we can make some headway there. Um, if it sends a bad message to the allies, um, I, I think that, I mean, I hate to put it in such blunt terms, but I think Possibly no one is more aware of uh, the risk of war than our allies in the region. Uh, South Korea and Japan are, are fully aware of what's at stake, probably very much more aware than the United States public is. So um, while I agree that our commitment to the allies in the region in no way should waver, I think that we do this as a step-by-step -step process with them and decide together what this is, because this is ultimately not about the United States and South and North Korea. Um, this is about a regional problem, in a, in a, and that needs to be handled in a regional way. Kelly, um, we're looking at the prospect of a somewhat more muscular approach to meet our deterrence and defense needs vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea. 
But of course, there's been an election. <laughs> and um, the political environment has shifted in ways that may not actually facilitate that type of, of process. Um, what should we do about that? Are we, can we even pursue the types of policies you recommend if, in fact, we are encountering headwinds even from our allies in the region? Sure. Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, I will agree with Melissa. We need to be on the same page as our allies um, as we do this. Um, but I also think that the new Moon government um, is not going to be incentivized to give up uh, deterrence too early if they even if they want to pursue a negotiation. So I actually think uh, the alliance is pretty strong. Um, I do think we have good mechanisms for talking through these kinds of issues. And I actually also think that we don't want to unilaterally disarm before we go into this negotiation. And I don't think Moon wants to either. So the question is, you know, can we convince the, the rocks that, you know, the military course of approach is actually going to be supportive of whatever they want to pursue on a diplomatic track? And I think it actually can be. And, and at a minimum, we need to be ready in the event it fails. And I think the, the no one understands that better than South Korea, um, that if diplomacy fails, we have to be ready. I mean, we have a saying, uh, in Seoul, you know, you know, fight tonight is the USFK um, sort of slogan. And the rocks really understand that, especially on the military and defense side of, of the government. Um, but it is a good question. I mean, I, it, I think it's too early to tell, frankly, what the new government's going to want to do. It, the president's meeting with him uh, next week or later this week, next week, um, is going to be really instructive. Um, but certainly we need to be on the same page. But I actually think, well, there are ways to do this where you can thread diplomacy with military coercion in the background. You know, we can kind of play, the, I mean, Trump to some degree is playing the crazy uncle in the attic. And we need to be thinking about how to change North Korean decision making on the negotiations themselves. And so us being the crazy uncle in the attic does have benefits in that regard. Okay. Um, we're going to get ready to move over to some audience questions. Um, please, I will try to go back and forth. I will try to keep some questions going either way. I have one final question for each side. There are microphones. Are we do we have stand? Where are we? Oh, it's just out of my line of vision. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so actually, feel free to start to assemble. Um, I, maybe what I'll do to just sort of make it easier to go back and forth, if your question will be directed uh, to Team Carol Hannum, Blynn, please uh, ask your question from over here. <laughs> and uh, same way to the other side, if you are for Kelly or John, put your question on this side. Feel free to come down. And while you're assembling, um, and I, I, there's at least a few people out here I know I can call on if you think you don't have questions ready. So those of you I know, uh, be ready. Um, a final question um, for, for you all, and you can decide who wants to answer, or a quick, a quick share, but it will just be a quick answer. It seems like that the tough part here is we're dealing with a leader in a country that seems easily provoked, seems quite unpredictable, um, the risks to military North Korea. <laughs> I heard that. Um, the risks are pretty enormous, right? I mean, even in terms of, of the danger of something we think we're doing on the defensive side as being perceived as provocation and taking us down a utterly terrifying road. So I guess my question for you is really, do you fundamentally believe that sanctions and non-military pressure exclusively have really run their course? Can we, you know, are, is there more we could do there? And in fact, is it important to back off of military pressure to avoid those provocations? Or have we really reached the point yeah. in the road where we have to take a bit more risk than we have in the past? So let me be clear. I don't think that we should brandish the military instrument in a sort of sl sloppy way. I think the Carl Vinson episode was a disaster. Um, it certainly undermined what the president was trying to achieve, I think. But there are ways to actually thread the needle. And I also don't buy necessarily the argument that Kim Jong-un is completely irrational. I'm, I'm not certain that that is the case. Um, I also think that, um, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a way to, to state this. The security dilemma that Kim Jong-un has with the United States 
is not a variable, it's a constant. And I'm not certain that if we decided tomorrow to stop doing military exercises or you know, withdraw half our forces from the peninsula would convince Kim Jong-un that we had somehow benign intent towards him. Like he's, it's baked into how he thinks, it's baked into how the regime is thinking. And so I think it's somewhat naive to think that a small adjustment in how we approach defense issues on the peninsula is gonna change the way he thinks about us in the negotiation. Okay, thank you. So I guess my question over here in some ways, you know, is almost an, an inverse of this. But as you look at this, you know, it seems that Kim Jong-un at his most basic uh, level is overwhelmingly concerned with his ability to stay in power. That seems to be the one thing everyone can agree seems to drive the thinking there. Um, he certainly speaks a language of force and fear. Um, I guess the question I would ask you is, how do we not just end up in the worst of all worlds? One where we've degraded the nonproliferation regime, we've accepted um, this sort of, uh, we've given up the goal of denuclearization for a cap, but we're still dealing with a nuclear armed adversary that's behaving in a highly combative fashion. And in the process, we've given up a number of things, because we'll, of course, even to get a cap, we would have to give up some significant things. And, and so you're sort of looking at that and saying, are we actually better off? Or is it more important for Kim Jong-un to understand some language of force? Um, don't push too far, or your status and your regime will be threatened. Um, so I guess that's really my question, is how do we not end up just worse off? Whichever. I guess I would say that I think we're already there. I mean, I, I hate to be a downer, but I think we've had our head in the sand for well over a decade at this point, and that uh, n North Korea, you know, regardless of what we can tell using satellite imagery or photo analysis, there's enough evidence to suggest that they already have these weapons, they already have the ability to deliver them, as John pointed out, I, I think there was a misunderstanding. Their, their shorter range missiles can carry warheads too. The Nodong, the, the, they're all nuclear capable. So um, this is not about ICBMs. This is, uh, this has already happened. We're already in that place. We are in the worst place. So now we are forced with some really painful decisions. And regardless of how you break out over military only or, or military mostly or diplomacy only, um, I think you're gonna have to make some really unpalatable decisions. And the question is, what weighs out to you? Is this more about uh, preserving the lives of tens or hundreds of thousands of people in a war that could erupt very quickly and, and involve multiple actors? Uh, or is it worth taking the risk of an imperfect, undesirable acknowledgement of a Kim Jong-un regime? We've made, we've had negotiations with adversaries before that, that were difficult, uh, Soviet Union. We've had discussions before uh, that, that though painful, you know, no one is saying that Kim Jong-un is a darling, he has a great human rights regime, or that I would ever wanna be in the same room with him. But I think at this point, he's got it, I mean, he's, he's got us, right? Like he's got us in that position where we're going to have to start making really awful, terrible decisions like that. Okay, on that very optimistic note. Sorry. No, it's, it's unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a, a wicked problem for a reason. Um, and so nonetheless, the options are not particularly good, so we are in search of the least bad. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn over to audience questions. It looks like we've got one on each side and we'll keep them coming. So to you, sir, if you would please say your name, your affiliation, and direct your question. Uh, I believe you're talking to this side. Mark Gottlieb, nuclear engineer, independent researcher, uh, unaffiliated though I like to use your library. Uh, <laughs> my question is this, knowing what I do about nuclear technology, it's clear the technical capability of North Korea is greatly aided by other sources. The reactor they have is based on the design of a Russian reactor. 
The missiles they have clearly resemble Russian missiles. And my question to the panel is, thinking more globally beyond the rubric of North Korea itself, are there advantages to Russia and China of a nuclear-armed North Korea that we should be considering in this debate? Would they be, in effect, fostering a nuclear-armed North Korea while giving the presentation of being concerned? I think we need to consider the more global axis in this regard. Would anyone care to respond to that? does sort of sound like one that could affect both the, mm -hmm. both sides of the discussion. I'll turn to you all first if you think there's an issue there. Um, I, I guess the, I, I don't, I can't comment on whether or not they're trying to encourage North Korea to, to, to develop their own nuclear weapons. I'm, I'm not sure that there's evidence of that. But the point that I will strongly agree on is the, the fact that our interests and countries like China's and Russia's interests when it comes to North Korea are different. This thought that if we just tell China and tell them um, forcefully or tell them nicely and then they'll start turning the screws and then we'll get our answer to North Korea is, is a false one. And it's, it's an illusion and it's not actually realistic. Part of the reason it's not realistic is because there's limits on the amount of leverage that China has. But part of the reason it's not realistic is that we have very different interests. China likes having a country in North Korea that it is friendly to it and is a buffer between US forces that are on the, the South Korean side. It likes having some weakness on the peninsula. It likes having US forces further away. And it probably wouldn't want a unified Korea that had nuclear weapons. So there's, there's different interests between the sides. And I think that, that we need to think about those interests as we think about what's realistic. China, Russia, do you all have a, how does that support or, or detract from some of your arguments? Well, the short answer to the question is yes. And your, your question was, should that be part of this debate? I think it absolutely should be part of it. My own, my own view is that, and my own understanding is that, clearly the early North Korean nuclear history is obviously supported by China and Russia with reactors, with, with materials, and so on. But you know, the training wheels came off probably in 2005 and six. AQ Khan and his network had a hand in it too. There, there, was, there was a black market out there and they took full advantage of it. I think, the, I think the consensus at this point is that they are, you know, not only are the training wheels off, they've got the keys to the car now. They can produce their own fissile materials. They can design and manufacture centrifuges. They have, even though it's a small facility, a five megawatt, what's called a Magnox reactor that can produce plutonium. They're building a 50 megawatt reactor. And so they don't need the assistance that they used to. They can do these things indigenously. That doesn't mean that they are 100%. I'm not privy to intelligence assessments that say otherwise. But um, North Korea t can do it on their own. Whether China or Russia benefit from having a nuclear armed and, and deliverable weapon from North Korea, I, that one to me is a more of a stretch. I mean, everything, everything that John said is true. There, there's some benefit to China to having a buffer state, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a really tough one. It's like having a neighbor that you're glad is one house between you and the next neighbor, but when your next door neighbor starts partying all night and lighting off fireworks, maybe not so much. So that, to me, is, is a red line question for China. Our, our red line, and the latest red line, is ICBM and mateable with a warhead. Is that China's? I think that's a pivotal question. Thank you. Thanks. All right. OK, uh, Larry Chastain, University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, in the past a couple of weeks, our missile defense agency has had some real successful tests. And I think it shows that missile defense works for what it was designed for, a limited missile defense against somebody exactly like North Korea. So my question is really to both sides. Why is this not one of the first things that's always brought up is that we have an effective limited missile defense against North Korea? Because a lot of times people will say that and they say, well, maybe it doesn't work so well. But I think if you go to Missile Defense Agency, they say it works. And I don't know why we don't get more positive PR for our current capabilities. I'll take it. Um, is that to us? Is that to both of us? Or? Well, they, well, start here. Well, I'll be okay. best people <laughs> respond. It's fine. Um, so that's a really good question. I think um, the test was remarkable, and I'm glad it was successful. There's a lot of debate, of course, about whether or not, you know, we test under realistic circumstances. Um, but from my opinion, you know, I think it's important that we continue to accelerate those efforts and do do more. Um, 
at a minimum to complicate how the North Koreans think about whether or not they could ever use one. So on the one hand, it's to protect you know, the, the United States. On the other hand, it's also to affect how the North Koreans think about use. So in my opinion, we should be doing more on GMD defense um, and accelerating it as best we can. Um, I'm not certain that the administration has budgeted for that, um, but we'll see. I guess um, I, in many ways I probably agree with Kelly. Um, the, the distinctions I would make are that the, the tests that have been conducted have been conducted under um, environments which are very specific. And while they're successful, it, it perhaps has not, or it definitely has not simulated what a North Korean ICBM launch would look like. So one of the challenges is we don't know how many would be launched, we don't know when they would launch, we don't know what they would target, and we don't know whether those missiles would have um, confusers like chaff or air balloons or even multiple independent reentry vehicles. So when, when they conduct these tests, it's not worthless. It, it's, a good, it's a good goal to work towards as long as it's fiscally in the interests of Americans. Um, but uh, I don't think it, that the technology will be ready in time for North Korea. I think, unfortunately, that um, you know that this may be a longer-term project than the conf than conflict with North Korea. Okay, thank you. Um, go ahead, and then I'll switch to here because you've been in there for a bit. Thank you. Um, my name is Fiona Cunningham. I'm a PhD candidate at MIT, um, and so I have a question, which is actually to both sides, directed at uh, Paul and at John. Uh, which is about uh, the ability of the United States and North Korea to control escalation if there is any sort of uh, conflict, be it nuclear or be it conventional. Because listening to the debate, it sounded like uh, Paul was quite pessimistic that if the United States engaged in some sort of limited strikes in response to North Korea, that um, North Korea would respond proportionately or would see things fairly, and therefore the US can't really control escalation if military force is used. Yet on the other hand, when John gave his presentation, he noted that North Korea could be using its nuclear capabilities to control escalation by, for example, threatening Japan. So I'm wondering whether actually the two sides agree or disagree on the ability to control escalation on the peninsula. Should we, are we simply making worst case assumptions that we shouldn't think we can control escalation uh, and we should assume that the North Koreans are optimistic about that and plan accordingly because that's the worst case scenario? Or are there more fundamental reasons why the US couldn't control escalation while North Korea possibly could? Right. Good question. Um, yeah, thank you. It's an excellent question. I, I want to first just start out by saying I am not a veteran. I never served in the armed forces. And I think that it's important to recognize that civilians in think tanks, organizations commenting on this is, is from a theoretical and academic point of view. And if there are military folks in the audience, I would solicit your input. Um, but, but the theory and the speculation is that as um, Kelly said earlier, with negotiations or diplomacy, you need a willing dance partner. Well, this holds doubly for controlling ex ex escalation. Excuse me. If the person you're shooting at doesn't perceive your shots in the way you intend them to, game over. You know. And so, the idea of controlling escalation, on the one hand, is is something that is, I suppose, useful in things like not you know, jumping the shark and going immediately to a nuclear strike when really all you meant was to, let's say, attack an airbase in Syria with chemical weapons, okay. But when you're talking about the North Koreans and you're talking about rhetorical war that has been going on for decades, when you're talking about military service people in South Korea, what, 40 miles from the DMZ? The, the notion or the comfort you take in, oh, that's okay, they'll know what we're up to, I don't think it exists, and it's extremely risky. Um, so I'll, I'll make a few points. For, first, uh, I think the main point is that our biggest fear should be if North Korea thinks they can control escalation. Because if North Korea thinks that they can use nuclear coercion to control escalation, then they will think that they have freedom 
to initiate more provocations and conflicts at a lower level, thinking that they will deter the U.S. and South Korea from getting to a higher level. So, in fact, if, if they have that ability and we don't have the forces to be able to counter it, war could actually become more likely because they, North Korea could miscalculate and become overconfident. So that, that's why when we talk about some of these capabilities, one of the things that I think we need capabilities for is to challenge that thinking. So if they don't think that they have the military capabilities to be able to manage and control escalation, then maybe, hopefully, that will induce caution. Uh, the yeah. second point. Oh, sorry. I was, I was just going to say I, I agree with that. In fact, someone who I have confidence in after the shelling of the South Korean islands a few years ago, so apparently, some of the assessments were the accuracy was really bad, and as and so the, the the theory is that if North Korea relies more on their nuclear weapons, their conventional forces deteriorate. They'll go there quicker. So I I, I just want to say that I agree with that. That's a problem. And just real quickly, two other two other things. I think one another uh, aspect that Paul alluded to, I think, is also in terms of controlling escalation. The the U.S. isn't the only party. South Korea and, and North Korea also are going to have a say in this. So, for example, with the example of the sinking of the, the Chonan and the shelling of Yongbyong, after that, there was a lot of sentiment in South Korea that we're not going to allow something like this to happen. And in fact, our response is going to be a lot bigger. So it may be that if the U.S. can try to prevent that, but we might not be able to control it. And then the last thing I will say is that kind of thinking more long term, and I think this is a harder problem for the U.S., the, Controlling, you're never going to have 100% confidence in controlling escalation. It's going to be a risky proposition. It's not anything that I would want to hope that you would have to execute. But the problem with not having, a, if you don't have a strategy for how you're going to fight a war while controlling escalation, then the only alternative is total war. So that means that if we say that any war we get into with North Korea, we can't control and there's no strategy in which we can control it, that means we're going to go after every nuclear capability they have and we're going to try to change the regime. So especially as their nuclear capabilities get to be a lot more sophisticated and a lot more diverse, we are going to have to, together with our South Korean allies, more realistically think about how we can deter and, if necessary, fight wars that can preserve our interests without forcing us to have to make the choice of going to the highest level very early, very quickly. And that's a very hard problem, and, and not there's no perfect answer, but I think that's the, the long-term challenge with North Korea's nuclear program. It, it does seem, and maybe we can kind of, we'll come back on a question on this, so I'll ask both sides to think about it a little bit. Um, it's an incredibly difficult proposition if, in fact, there is no space between limited response and user lose. Mm -hmm. If we're pushing North, you know, if anything, if we do anything, creates the, perception that they're in a user lose posture, I think, yes, that's bad. On the other hand, it's, it's probably even in worse in the sense that we don't have any ways to manage. It, it drives us to overwhelming restraint um, in situations where that may be unacceptable. So it's incredibly difficult. And another thing neither side's really addressed yet, but which is another very difficult issue, is if you get to a deterrence type relationship, if we have to get to a point where we're living with the nuclear arm North Korea, um, a lot of those premises are, ba you can't have a, a strategy and an standing policy um, of eliminating the regime, of reunification on terms of the South, and say I'm going to have a deterrence relationship between these parties. And Kelly, I'm looking at you to kind of think about this issue because that is incredibly difficult. Um, that means you're always attempting to deter an adversary who is always in a use or lose position. That's a that's a recipe. So on yeah. either side, there's some big concessions in the policy domain to be made if we're going to live with a North, North Korea with a nuclear armed missile capability. While you ponder that and perhaps work some of those <laughs> thoughts into your um, rebuttal, uh, then what I want to do is, is kind of come back around. Actually, I'm realizing we didn't actually rebut. We'll work that together. Go ahead. <laughs> I was wondering what happened. I got caught up. <laughs> I got caught up in all the questions. Uh, I'm uh, Nathaniel Mahold. I'm an undergraduate here, and I work with the NSSC. Uh, and my question is about uh, 
controlling North Korea in a slightly different way, kind of inspired by, John, something that you talked about. If uh, You guys have articulated very well that we're close to a worst case scenario in terms of uh, weapon development for North Korea. Some of the things that the negation talked about were um, the idea that uh, it would be bad to let up on sanctions because it could increase uh, their economic ability to develop nuclear weapons. But one of the things that I was really wondering about as we're looking at ways to control North Korea is uh, can we think about if we increase foreign investment in North Korea, increase their uh, economic ties with the rest of the world, and maybe mollify like uh, some of their like leadership and increase the standard of living of their population so that they're not so uh, like destitute, um, and, like solve some of their economic problems, we might be able to see a North Korea more amenable to talking about um, getting rid of such uh, like volatile nuclear uh, like weapon options. So, um, well, it's it's a good question. I, I think that um, the the risks of that, however, are that you're essentially setting up a scenario where we succumb to nuclear blackmail. Um, so I think it's you know, one I think there's I'm not certain that Kim Jong Un is actually would ever allow us to make those kinds of investments in his country, for, in part because he wouldn't be able to control it. Um, so he has his own interest in that, in keeping kind of suppression of the society. Um, but also, I would I would be very wary about creating a standard of of nuclear blackmail for for global investment. I, I think in theory it sounds like an interesting premise. I just think in actual practice, I think it would be quite destructive. Okay. All right. What I'm going to do because we've we've had such a good exchange that we're actually coming to the end of our time, and the moderator. Uh, did make the mistake of skipping over one of the responses, but I have a solution. Uh, so um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take these last two questions. Um, so go ahead. I want you to actually put your questions up. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to uh, John and then um, Melissa to make the rebuttal points, and then we'll move to the closing arguments from Kelly and Paul. So it'll really be an opportunity for you all to pick up the pieces and then for your debating partner to, uh, to lock in the closure. But I think what we'll do is have a chance to answer some of these questions to put them on the table as part of that process. So we'll roll it together if that's all right, keep you on your toes. Um, and we were at this side before, so we'll take this question over here. I'll try to keep this one very short then. My name's Drake Brewster. I'm at the Naval Postgraduate School, and it's specifically for the affirmative side. So we kept talking about a cap. And so when we talk about a cap, it comes down to a treaty and how we count warheads slash cores. Right now it's a mess. So if you put 20 nuclear warheads on a bomber, it counts as one. So capping doesn't necessarily stop the number of warheads or the special nuclear material they can have. So a cap does not stop the possibility of smuggling a warhead. So how does your plan deal with smuggling a warhead, which is the, the controlling the what do we call it, the, uh, we just used the word, controlling the tempo of the engagement. That's how you do it, you smuggle a warhead in. So we'll, oh. we're gonna come, I'm gonna, ah, I'm gonna roll these the in, and then we'll okay. put that in the rebuttal, but this kind of, I think this question of what are we capping exactly, I think this would be really helpful. Henrietta. Um, Henrietta, currently at Lawrence Livermore, starting my PhD um, at Princeton in the fall. I wanted to ask about the use of offensive cyber weapons in this dilemma and how it relates to either using diplomatic tools or military tools um, subsequently and how North Koreans' reactions to the use of um, cyber we weapons uh, would influence U.S. ability to control the situation. Okay. All right. Good question. I think yeah, that applies to both. Go ahead. Harry Andreatis with the Nuclear Engineering Department at Berkeley. Um, do we, well the one thing I haven't heard is what end state are we willing to accept for North Korea? In the sense that India, we had issues when they became a weapon state, but now we're trying to push them into the nuclear suppliers group. Um, do we envision an end state that we can agree on, essentially, with North Korea? Okay, great. Well, good luck with the, the closers on that one, because that's a, that's a great closing comment. Okay, so what I'm going to do and uh, is I'm going to turn first to John, then to Melissa, and then to Paul and to Kelly, and you'll have five minutes apiece, and then you'll get to ask them all kinds of questions during the reception. Um, so with that. 
Um, so I'll just, just to start, I, I think that it's not, it's not a choice just between negotiation or war. I don't think that we should execute a preventative war against North Korea, and I don't think that we should go in for a negotiation in which we're willing to make large concessions in order to get them to cap their program or not produce ICBMs for many of the reasons we talked about. The question is, what are you going to give up and what are you going to get back? And we've started to get into some of the specifics, but my general premise or my general argument or, is that what we are willing – would actually be required to get North Korea to come to the table and accept a meaningful cap is more than what would, we would actually get out of it. So if we had to give up things like a whole bunch of um, relief of sanctions, if we had to suspend military exercises, that would have real impacts both in decreasing our military capability but also potentially expanding North Korea's military and nuclear capability. And the benefit wouldn't be that large because North Korea would still have – these forces, and, and I do agree with Melissa, that they have the ability on me, short range, medium range missiles to already fire a nuclear weapon. So they would still have this nuclear force of capability that they would threaten against our allies. So that's the dilemma, and that's the reason why there should, we should have a lot, some, some questions or some hesitations about pushing forward with that kind of deal. Instead, the, there are other options, and that is building up our offensive and defensive capabilities. Um, the question about cyber weapons, I, I think that cyber weapons should be part of the type of capabilities that we are thinking about when we're trying to hold – to deter or to prevent North Korea from being able to operate or coerce with impunity. Um, how North Korea would respond, how effective those capabilities would be, I, I don't really know or can't get really get into the details, but certainly think that that's an avenue that we should be able to pursue. And then the last question about kind of what, what, is, the, what is the end state? I think that, that's the hard question. Um, so from my perspective, and Kelly probably has a slightly different perspective, and she'll probably get to that. Um, but from my perspective, the, there are no good options, and our best option is to try to deter and contain the threat as much as possible, stay on the same page with our allies, and then hope that over time the situation changes. Either the Kim regime um, is, has a change of heart, or there's a, some kind of change in the Kim regime, but that if we make a whole bunch of concessions to this regime, given how much they care about their nuclear forces and are going to be unwilling to give them up, and that given the investment that they've already made at it, we're not going to be able to get a deal that's actually going to be satisfactory or all that beneficial for them. So I just want to – I'll make two important distinctions, I think, that, that will address some of the, the questions and some of their comments. First is that – just saying that we shouldn't pursue a negotiation that's focused on ICBMs or focused on a cap doesn't mean that I don't think that we should have talks. I think we should definitely have talks with North Korea. We should have talks about making it so that there's not miscalculation. We should have talks about avoiding deconfliction. We should have talks about areas where there's uh, disagreement like the Northern Limit Line, which is a kind of sea territorial dispute. Those are areas for talks. What I don't think we should do is focus on ICBMs, focus on cast, ca uh, capping ICBMs, and offer a whole bunch of concessions in that area. And then second, to again make this point about preventative and preemptive. I don't think that we should initiate a preventative strike against North Korea's capabilities. Preventative meaning there's not an imminent threat, but we're trying to prevent a later uh, harm or a later capability. But I do think that the type of ca capabilities that Kelly described in the first speech about building up intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, building up strike forces, building up those kind of things are the type of forces we need so that we can threaten preemption and therefore deter North Korea from carrying out this kind of tit for tat that they might pursue if they're confident in their capabilities. So the real concern is preventing war, but the, I think the, one of the main differences is that in, in, our, in our opinion, or in my opinion at least, uh, we're more likely to prevent war by showing strength and resolve with our allies by building up these capabilities rather than by pursuing the type of deal that's focused on a cap and still would allow them to keep a lot of the capabilities but also have more investment in a more normal diplomatic relationship. Thank you. Melissa. So uh, Rebecca asked us not to all violently agree in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the challenge. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm first going to go through some of the points, excellent points that John and Kelly uh, mentioned, and uh, then I'm going to try to sum up and answer some of the big picture questions. So 
I think one of the things that Kelly raised that resonated with me is the idea that North Korea is not a willing partner. Um, and, and I think it's very easy to see from the outside that that, you know, it seems true. Um, if you read KCNA statements as carefully as I do, and you even perhaps run them through sentiment analysis and really nerd out on them, <laughs> you'll find that a lot of these statements, though very negative overall about the United States, leave an open question at the end. It's always until the US changes its behavior, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Until the US stops threatening us, X, Y, Z. So what I'm suggesting is that we haven't met that point where they're willing to discuss yet. Perhaps we haven't, uh, you know, I think the simple removal of preconditions to talks is probably the first way to get your foot in the door. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, unfortunately, recognizing the Kim regime may be part of that equation. Um, that seems to be the, the thing that makes them most paranoid. And, and honestly, it's not paranoid, right? I mean, the U.S. has been practicing decapitation exercises with South Korea for some time now. Um, we openly threatened to nuke them since the 50s. Um, it's not paranoid if it's real. So I think we, in, in the effort of making or building even a modicum of trust, may have to roll back some of our own fiery rhetoric um, in order to, 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 to begin negotiations in an effective way. Uh, she also raised that uh, these, these negotiations may fail. Uh, and that's, unfortunately, that's, that's just the cards that we're dealt with. Um, they may indeed fail. Um, the larger question, something that John touched on as well, is will they move along the path while we're failing at negotiations? I think this is probably the real crux of it, because in a way, that's what we've already been doing, right? So the last 10 years have been, of, uh, unfortunately, largely st strategic patience, has been them having a bonanza in technology. Um, and so I do think that uh, what, what action is, that you know, whatever action we choose has to be decisive, and it has to uh, come out very quickly because mm -hmm. they're probably going to uh, test a lot of new stuff in the future and they're gonna get better and better at it. Um, John, I think maybe he and I had, uh, are especially violently agreeing. Um, I think that um, when I discuss about missile tests and missile caps, I'm talking about the whole missile uh, caboodle. Um, this is not just about ICBMs for me. Um, mostly what I'm interested in is no tests that involve a warhead on a missile, because that's still something they have to verify. So whether it's a Nodong or a Scud or if it's an ICBM, what, what I really don't want is them to, able to demonstrate that they can put a warhead on it. China did it in 1964 by flying over their own territory and exploding it in the west western part of China. This is, there's no safe direction for North Korea to test a live nuclear warhead on a missile. This is also true, is there's no real good way for us to know that it's just a test. <laughs> so this is, this is, you know, one of the caps that I would like to talk about. Um, um, I, I also don't agree in rolling back sanctions. I do not want money to go into the funding of the, of the program. Um, so that, to me, that's not really on the table until much, much later after many, much more trust has been built. Uh, and, and I don't think we need to curb our, our readiness per se. I still think investments in homeland and uh, uh, allies security are very important. Um, to answer some of the bigger questions, um, what are we talking about with capping? So this is, this is what I wish I could talk for an hour about, but I have 30 seconds. So I will say that <laughs> verification is going to be painful, intrusive, just obnoxious. It's going to, make, it's going to have to make the Iran deal look like a cakewalk. Um, and, and that is going to be the hardest thing to negotiate. And in the agreed framework, I think that kind of was the part where it started falling apart. So we have to do a better job. The good news is we have better tools than ever before. Not perfect, you know, not x-ray vision from Superman, but we have a lot more satellite imagery, civil society paying attention, uh, a lot more smart border technology, and I think for the first time ever, really willing partners, China, we were talking about China earlier. China doesn't want North Korea. Like, 
So it's not thrilled about having a nuclear North Korea, but what it really doesn't want is a collapsed state. They are watching their borders now, more than they ever have before. Uh, they don't want illicit materials coming over their border. And uh, with satellite imagery, we can actually keep pretty good tabs on what is crossing. So that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, Kelly, closing okay. statement. Um, so I think Melissa and I are going to agree on a lot, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so I held you all back for we, a while. Yeah, I mean the reality. This is a this is a tough problem. I think we've de we've walked through that today. Um, my fundamental view is diplomacy can work, but it needs to be part of an aggregated strategy, and a strategy that employs all of our instruments of power, uh, whether it's sanctions or whether it's deterrence and reassurance. Um, whether it's messaging and signaling, I think all of that needs to be integrated. Um, it's very difficult to do. <laughs> um, none of us have succeeded thus far at that, but I think it has to be part of a broader mix. I also think we need to, for it to be successful, we also need to get outside the, the box that we have been in uh, and develop a little bit more of a coercive approach uh, to change the negotiation dynamic with, with North Korea, but also, frankly, to change the negotiation dynamic with China. Um, we can't enter into any diplomatic negotiation with the perception that we're more interested in the deal than anybody than the adversary. And I think it's important for us, um, as we consider diplomacy, to ensure that we're in the best possible position uh, to achieve a solution. Um, and so, while a diplomatic solution is pre preferable, the current conditions I feel are not necessarily conducive to one. And that's why we need to change it. And we have other instruments and tools to be able to do so. Um, you know, one of the concerns I have, which we didn't get to in, in the conversation, was that, you know, as much as a limited d deal sounds attractive and is probably the most achievable thing, whether it's a cap or, or a moratorium, whatever you want to call it, I also fear that with this, with this guy, Kim Jong-un, it could end up being the final deal. And, you know, he may end up, you know, accepting a lot on the front end from us, agreeing to an ICBM moratorium, and then that's it. And I think that actually could leave us in a much worse position. Um, I think this deal, at a minimum, would have to be, you know, d demonstrate a roadmap towards a broader, more comprehensive deal that addresses all aspects of the nuclear program. Um, it also addresses aspects of human rights and other issues uh, in the long run. Um, the problem with that is that China is not going to buy the horse twice in this. So I think whatever pressure China is going to put on North Korea is going to be. Um, kind of a one-time only deal. And so if we use it for an ICBM only deal, I actually have real concerns about whether or not they would be willing to do much more pressure than that. Um, so diplomacy is not mutually exclusive from everything else we're talking about. And this is where I think we're all mostly in agreement. Um, and to the, to the end state question, I think it's obviously the, the best question. Um, you know, there's a difference between what we seek as an end state and what we can actually achieve as an end state. Um, and a lot of it, you know, in, in negotiation can change. Um, so in my mind, you know, an en a real de our desired end state is a comprehensive deal um, that addresses both the nuclear program and the, and the ballistic missile program. Now, where we end up, I think, would probably end up being a deal that, that limits, not removes entirely the risks um, to our homeland and to our allies. Um, and that also limits the proliferation risk in the region, which is another thing that, you know, was sort of alluded to with the, whatever it was, truck bomb or, you know, smuggling a nuclear weapon. I, that, I think that's the proliferation concerns actually are, are pretty serious. So even if you were able to achieve a testing moratorium um, or a freeze on their enrichment, um, there's broader risks about proliferation, which would have to be addressed. So again, it sort of depends on what you're seeking and where you end up. And I think... Um, at a minimum, you know, we need to ensure the defense of our homeland and the security of our allies. Um, I want to kind of get back to the point that John made earlier. Um, the thing that concerned me most when I was in my job in the Pentagon um, about North Korea was not the necessarily the nuclear demonstrations of capability, whether it was tests or missile tests or nuclear tests. It was actually the conventional provocations. And uh, those are the most dangerous um, in terms of lighting up uh, the peninsula. I mean, you just go to the DMZ and you stand on it and you can see firsthand how quickly things could get out of hand um, and how much of a hairpin trigger the north is on and how much of a hairpin trigger the south is also on. Um, and so any kind of d deal or decision 
um, that leaves us in a position where North Korea is able to nuclear, nuclearly coerce um, the region and or think that you know we're not willing to fight and prevail in a limited war is a problem. Um, so we need to get back to the, the basics on conventional deterrence um, and demonstrate that we can fight a limit, fight and win a limited war. And I think that's as important as some of the dip diplomatic play. Thank you. Oh. Just occurred to me, I went first and last, is, and it's not because Plowshares helps fund this, so I just want to make that clear. <laughs> Um, and you also didn't want us to all violently agree, so maybe I'll just change my tone and be a little snarky for the first minute or two when I push back on just a couple specific points, but then I, I want to sort of close it with some broader themes also. And I'm going to try to quickly touch on these three questions, the one about the cap scenario, offensive cyber, and the end state. So a couple of quick pushbacks. Kelly, when you talked about some of your recommendations about you know, beefing up defenses and maybe increasing THAAD deployments and even ground-based missile defense for the U.S. and helping ROK and Japan and so on. To me, this sounded like a world in which North Korea has missiles. This is a lot of shield and not a lot of scalpel, not a lot of diplomacy. So just wanted to note that. That, that to me, seems like a pound of cure and not an ounce of prevention. Have you seen Wonder Woman? The shield not yet. My daughter's going right now, and I want to go see it. Um, John, you said negotiations have very little chance of success, and I, I wouldn't dispute that, but I would take that over 100% of disaster with Korean War 2.0. Um, the other thing is that your, your point about limiting the joint exercises or maybe pulling back on them a bit, I don't think Melissa and I are, are suggesting skipping them, but would diminish our readiness or diminish our um, extended deterrence. This is another sort of pet peeve, and I, I'm not suggesting you don't agree, but you know, preemption and prevention are very different. Deterrence and nuclear de deterrence are very different, and they have been getting conflated for years. It, it really bugs me. Um, I would submit that North Korea has been deterring us since well before their 2006 nuclear test because they have, even though they might be beat up and a little rusty, the ability to level Seoul overnight with artillery. Likewise, I would submit that we have the ability to deter them from doing certain high-level things because of our overwhelming conventional forces. I mean, it's pretty darn impressive what we can do in minutes from around the globe. And so I just want to I just want to point that out. But if the concern about rolling back on the exercises is that it will somehow be perceived of diminishing deterrence in Pyongyang, I don't buy that. Between between our subs, whether conventional or nuclear, I, I just I, I don't buy that. Um, it may be more of a political pill to swallow for Seoul or Japan than an actual real world diminishment of any military capability. Um, and then the last thing, and, and I, please, I'm kind of in character. Um, when you talked about <laughs> hope and, and uh, maybe Kim Jong-un will have a change of heart, I mean, that sounds a little bit like our side that people would critique and say, what are you, nuts? So, I would like um, to second, what yeah. are you not? <laughs> <laughs> now, the other thing I will say, kind of, it's somewhat of a quip, but it's also real. Kim Jong-un currently is the longest serving leader in the party we're talking about. He's been in there since, what, December of 2011 when his father passed away. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that he's, you know, he has some gravitas, but he's been at this consolidation of power and leading, you know, although it would be a dictatorship, leading a nation on a path of certain endeavors longer than our own president, longer than the brand new moon presidency in South Korea. So I, I just think that's important to note. Um, so out of that for a minute. Back to diplomacy. I think Melissa was getting at this, uh, this phrase, if diplomacy fails. Well, the, the, the nice thing about diplomacy is you get a lot of batters. You know, it's not a one and done. It's a process. You keep trying. It's sort of like hunting for a job. You're going to get 50 no's before you get a yes. And you need to have the stomach for that. It needs to get a high priority from the US administration. It needs consistency, patience, persistence, and also tolerance for bumps. We're, what, 40 miles from Silicon Valley. And the motto there is fail often and fail fast. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take your point. We don't, we don't have forever. But diplomacy is not you know, a one and done prospect. The flip side is a military attack would be. We know how that, well, in certain respects, we know how that would end. It might be a military success, but it would be a failure 
of what we're after, which is um, a peaceful, stable, denuclearized peninsula. That's sort of the end state I jumped ahead. So some quick ideas of what, what might this look like. We could limit the exercises somewhat. We could open an interest section in Pyongyang. The UK has done it. We were supposed to have done this under the agreed framework, and it just didn't quite happen. Um, we could allow them to come here more. The visas, we just, don't, we just don't allow them. And when there are some track two opportunities, they don't happen. We should be a little more uh, forgiving. Forgiving is not the right word. Give them a little more latitude on that. Uh, the peace regime, the armistice, ending the armistice, something they have been very consistent in asking for. So we need to crawl before we walk and walk before we run. And that's my point to the gentleman from the Naval Postgraduate School. I f sorry, I forgot your first name. But um, a, a CAP scenario, we just need to begin talking before we even talk about a CAP. We just want to say, hi, remember us? Um, the offensive cyber weapon question, oh my god, to me this is the Wild West. And that's a whole other debate. But when it comes to North Korea, this is exactly the kind of fight you don't want to get into because of the asymmetrical nature of it. You don't need much to be effective at it. We've seen that with the Sony hack. Um, and so the, finally, the end state, as I, my end state would be a denuclearized Korean peninsula. That means us too. And a stable future for the peninsula. Doesn't necessarily mean unification yet. Um, again, that my end state is maybe 15 years off, not 40. So thank you. OK. Well, it's been a great discussion and uh, a lot of information put on the table. Um, I, it's true. Several of the panelists have said, well, you didn't want us all to end up in the same place. And of course, you kind of wanted to converge. <laughs> I think that must be something about the character of pony debates. Everyone wants to sort of get together and do good at the end of the day. Um, but uh, what we recognize, it's just probably a lot of different ways and different choices to make as you go. And that in those individual choices lie a lot of um, difficult decisions with potential risks and potential benefits. But I always value a really good discussion with smart people who are interested in solutions over polemics. And I think that is definitely something we had here today. Um, so we may not have drawn out the polemical extremes, but I think we have teased out some of the, what the different toolkits look like and how they might be balanced or reset in different ways to emphasize different types of outcomes, different types of risks. Um, so I want to thank all of you for doing that and for joining us for this session. I would like to thank the audience for your terrific participation. Excellent questions. In fact, they were so good that you distracted me from my job as moderator. Uh, so we've had to regroup. So thank you to the panelists for that. And um, in particular, again, just want to thank to Plowshares for supporting this endeavor. Would like to thank Bethany Goldblum and the team here at Berkeley who made this possible. And, uh, and, and also like to thank the, the team, uh, the CSIS team, the ones, in fact, who went shopping at Costco so we can uh, help enjoy our reception at the end here. So, um, so with that, what I want to do is encourage all of you to join me now in thanking our panelists for a great discussion and then give you the opportunity to ask them and us and each other some more important questions over um, our reception, which is upstairs. Is that right? So please join us there um, for the next few minutes. So in any case, thank you very much.